My name is Dr. Jean McGill. I am in the private practice of orthodontics in both Easton and Strasburg, Pennsylvania. I've been practicing for almost 20 years. I graduated from the University of Michigan in 1995. And I also serve as an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Orthodontics at Rutgers School of Dental Medicine. I first became introduced to Propel in April of 2012 uh, when I was an original beta, beta tester for the product. I've been utilizing it in my private office since that time. And I also teach Propel to my residents. I've been a Propel patient myself. Um, I've used Propel on myself. I've had friends practice on me. I've had residents practice on me. Um, and so tonight we're going to talk about my journey with Propel. And so our goals for tonight, we're going to review the background of the company and technique briefly. We're going to discuss the utilization of the technique in my private practice setting. And we're going to wrap it up with case reports of Propel patients from my private practice. I have a wide variety of cases to share with you, um, things I consider to be difficult movements. Uh, I've got two impacted canine cases, an extraction crowding case, three non-extraction crowding cases, uh, closing an old extraction case that was originally treatment planned for an implant, and we're going to wrap it up with an Invisalign case, and we should have about five minutes for questions and answers at the end. And so how does microosteoperforation work? Um, this research uh, was, we know that bone remodeling is the late rate limiting factor in orthodontic treatment, and anything that we can do to try to speed that up um, will help us to see faster results. Um, so research uh, showing that dense bone is softened and helping us to increase our treatment uh, movement about two times. So we're going to talk a little bit about the science behind microosteoperforation. I know a lot of you are already familiar with that. And so we know that when we apply a force on the tension side, we'll see bone resorption on the pressure side, causing the tooth to move in the intended direction. If we apply too heavy of a force, we'll see some undermining resorption and necrosis. Sorry, it's advancing by itself here. Um, so we struggle as orthodontists to keep our force levels into an optimal zone so that we don't overwhelm the system. And so we're all familiar with the process of bone remodeling. Uh, we want to try to keep our force levels in the zone that facilitates it, and Propel helps us to soften up the bone leading to faster remodeling. Okay, the science for what's behind Propel came out of NYU in a clinical study that was performed there. Uh, they looked at microosteoperforations in a clinical setting. And this work was published in the AJODO. The objective was to study microosteoperforations and also to look at the expression of inflammatory markers. This was a clinical study. And it was basically a split mouth study, um, it, very similar to what we did when we beta tested the product. It looked at premolar space closure. Um, one side was treated, one side was untreated. and the treated side experienced space closure at the rate of twice of the untreated side. And so you can see the comparison of the treated side and the untreated side, and especially you can note in slide D that it's really obvious that the patient's treated side had much greater tooth movement than the untreated side. And that was calculated out to be um, two times the rate of the untreated side. 
And so key points to remember from the study is that we saw about a two times the increase in velocity of tooth movement uh, when looking at canine retraction. There was uh, no tipping. Patients had very little post-treatment discomfort. Um, and I can tell you honestly, as someone who has had Propel myself, it's, it's really not a very scary thing. It's not very uncomfortable at all. Um, I would highly encourage any of you um, who are considering bringing Propel into your practice to have a staff member go through the uh, treatment or yourself. I think it really makes it less scary. Um, and it helps to make your patients feel more comfortable. So we're going to talk a little bit about different modalities in accelerated orthodontics. And so basically there's two types. There's patient controlled and there's doctor controlled. And so first we're going to talk a little bit about the patient controlled. Um, on the left you can see there's a light activated bone regeneration um, appliance. This is from Biolux. I don't believe it's out on the market yet. And it's very similar um, to the Acelident in that it requires patient compliance about 20 minutes a day. On the right side you can see, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Acelident um, product. It is a rechargeable device. The patient is required to self-administer for about 20 minutes a day. It's highly dependent on patient compliance. It's expensive. It's about $1,000 per device. I uh, personally have experience with Acelident. Um, when I initiated my orthodontic treatment, I purchased one. Actually, it was deemed to be our office demo unit, but I still had to pay about $1,000 for it. Um, I was really pretty faithful with it for a while, and then I went on a trip. I misplaced my charger. And that was pretty much the end of it. I, I found my charger about six months later, but you know I really haven't kind of gotten back into the swing with it. So it, I think the fact that it is um, highly dependent on patient compliance is is a really downside to to using that appliance. Plus, um, it, it really is non-specific as far as sight. You, it, it's moving all of the teeth all the time, uh, whether you want them to or not. So if you have any anchorage issues, uh, you're really not going to be able to control that with, uh, with the Acelident. And we can talk a little bit about doctor-controlled accelerated, accelerated orthodontics. Um, the slide on the left is a picture of a corticotomy. A lot of people know this as Wilkodonics. Um, depending on which area of the, of, of the country you practice in, you may or may not be familiar at all with this technique. Um, where I teach at Rutgers, we have a very strong relationship with our perio department. I've seen multiple patients who've been treated with the Wilkodonics. Um, even one of my clinic patients at school was treated with Wilkodonics uh, for treatment of a lower molar. Um, very similar to the la one of the last cases that I'm going to show you tonight, except that the patient was a lot younger. She was in her early 30s, um, and frankly, I was underwhelmed by the tooth movement that we got with the Wilkodonics. I thought for what the patient had to go through and how much it cost, um, I really did not seem to think that it was worth, worth the while for, for the Wilkodonics. Um, the middle slide is uh, PCO surgery. Um, also, still, you know, a lot more, you know, less invasive, not quite as brutal a procedure as the uh, Wilco. Um, still very expensive. Um, depending on where you are in your area, your periodontist may or may not be um, performing this. And on the right, we've got the micro osteoperforation with the Propel appliance. It is, uh, you know, not very invasive very little patient recovery, the cost is very low, and the training is also um, pretty easy. And so this is taking a look at the two different types of uh, Propel drivers. The top was, is what is called the accelerator driver. This is the original appliance. It is a disposable appliance. Um, you can see where the arrow is. There's a dial-up 
for, um, for your depth. Uh, the really great thing about this driver is that it, ha it has a nice LED light on it. So when you get to the required depth, it, it lights up and it's, it's really very uh, easy to see. On the bottom is the new driver, um, which has a, dis uh, a sterilizable handle. The, the blue handle that you see is, um, is completely sterilizable. It comes with either an open or a closed tip. We like the closed. Um, and the tips are um, completely disposable. They reworked the um, they re reworked the flute angle on the cutting burr, and it's it's really nice. It it's it's a lot more quickly. It does things a lot faster than um, the old appliance. And so we're going to talk about um, benefits of microosteoperforation. Just to summarize, it it really accelerates your orthodontic treatment with um, minimal discomfort to the patient. It can be used with either aligners or braces. The doctor completely controls the application. Um, it's not compliance driven by the patient. And in today's society, a lot of patients are interested in this kind of technology. They want to reduce their treatment time, and they're willing to pay a premium for it. Plus, you're, you know, you're, you're seen as a cutting edge practice and, um, and up on the latest technology. And so we're going to spend a few slides talking about technique. Um, you can use basically whatever anesthetic you are comfortable with. Um, I've been using, as I said, I've been using the Propel technique for about two years. I have never felt the need to um, infiltrate with my patients. Um, we've used a variety of different um, topicals. I'm going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, you can use whatever you'd like, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, the topical goes by a couple of different names. You're going to palpate the area, evaluate your x-ray, have the patient uh, use a chlorhexidine rinse for one minute at the beginning and one minute, one minute after you've completed it. Um, and then you're going to use your topical. So dry the area off, use a small amount of, of the topical. We like to use the BTT formula that is listed on the left side. Um, you know, we've gotten it before from a pharmacy in California. Um, currently, I have um, a mother in my practice who owns a compounding pharmacy. We order it directly from her. Um, some doctors like to order it in a syringe and, and use that for application. We just leave it in the container that it comes with in the refrigerator. That's really key. Um, you get it onto the area with a micro brush, and then we'll usually put a piece of gauze over that because once it starts to heat up to your body temperature, it, it starts to kind of get a little bit runny. I highly recommend having an assistant sit with the patient while you've got the topical on. Um, if you're working on the lower, be careful. Um, maybe consider sitting your patient up for that. I, I did have a situation one time where um, a patient, and of course it was an adult female physician, um, kind of swallowed some of the, the topical because you know it ran down the back of her throat. We weren't really being super careful about it. And she kind of had a coughing fit and felt like she was losing her airway and it was kind of a lot of drama. So um, definitely have an assistant sit there while the patient's getting numb. Um, rinse dry, get the gel off. Um, and have the patient sit for about 10 minutes to let the area get completely numb. Check it with an explorer, and then you should be good to go. And so you're going to set your, uh, your accelerator to the desired depth that you'd like to use. It is uh, very similar to placing a TAD. Um, you're going to rotate it clock clockwise until you get to the depth that you are desiring, um, and then you rotate it back. I usually will place most of my uh, perforations on the buckle for ease of access, and with my um, exposures, I'll tend to go all around the tooth and then kind of lead a trail up to where the, um, 
where I want the tube to go, kind of like a trail of breadcrumbs. This is the Propel um, consent form that we use in my office. We will usually have the patient complete that form and sign off on it before we actually schedule the appointment. Uh, it just makes it easier and it just saves time on the day of the appointment. Um, we're going to talk about the fact that most of our patients uh, will, will just do one or two treatments. There's very few situations where I felt the need to do more than that. Um, you know, every now and again we'll do three. You will be doing two to three uh, perforations in an area. You're going to get a response that's going to go um, six to ten millimeters around your treatment site so that you can kind of plan your sites accordingly. Um, in the anterior, we will use three millimeters. We'll use five to seven in the posterior, and on the palate, you're usually at seven uh, with that thick tissue. Um, we used to use a lot shorter interval intervals. Uh, we were, you know, going at four to six weeks, but now they have science that's demonstrated that you can um, you can get treatment effect um, to ten to twelve weeks. So we've started to spread our treatments out further. And this just shows you're going to perform your perforations in either a linear or triangular fashion in the area um, where you want to have the effect. And that treatment effect is going to extend out. It's going to fan out about 6 to 10 millimeters. This, um, this slide talks about using um, accelerated treatment with aligners. Um, you can you can use this either proactively, meaning you're gonna you're gonna talk to your patient prior to the start of treatment about using Propel with their aligners, um, or you can use it actively. Maybe if things aren't tracking well, or you want to try to avoid um, a refinement. Um, I'm gonna my last case that I'm gonna show is an Invisalign case, um, and my patient had two treatments and she was very highly motivated and she was able to get herself down to four to five days per liner. And so again with um, with using accelerated treatment with the brackets you can do it either proactively meaning you, you start at the beginning of treatment and you talk to the patient about the the fact that you'd like to use Propel before you initiate treatment or reactively to get yourself out of a, you know, a situation that's taking too long or you've got some patient burnout. Um, I'm going to show it both ways with my clinical cases. And um, I have to say that lately we've really kind of changed our mindset on it where everything used to be all reactive where we were just primarily using it to get out of, out of situations or um, things that we just needed to kind of speed up the process. And now we're using much more um, pr proactive application, primarily with our adult patients who want to um, accelerate their treatment. I had a patient that I uh, treatment plans yesterday who is missing seven teeth. Um, he would like me to close up as much space as humanly possible. And I, I told him, I think that with Propel and some TADS, you can probably close up all but one one space, I would say probably one tooth. This slide just shows um, immediately after the treatment and you can see it's really very minimal um, and having had this done on myself it's really not that big of a deal. A little sloughing, maybe this is 30 minutes after, you know, a little sloughing. Highly, highly, highly recommend. You need to talk to your patients about what medications they're taking. Um, if they are on any non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs on a daily basis for a medical condition, then you really need to th rethink whether or not you want to use Propel on them because the NSAIDs will shut down the um, cytokine response that we're attempting to accelerate with the um, Propel treatment. And so patients that can't get off those drugs are, are just not good candidates for Propel. So you want to make sure that your patients are only taking Tylenol for discomfort, and, and usually nobody really ever needs anything. It's, it's, it's very not a big deal. And so there's lots and lots of different cases. 
that um, that you can use. I mean, pretty much anything you can think of. It's really great for crowding. Um, as I said before, it's really great for space closure. And one of my favorite cases is closing up an old extraction site that was originally treatment planned for an implant. That's we're going to talk about that later. Um, I'm getting ready to use it on um, some Carrier distalizer cases. Um, Invisalign works great. Pretty much, you name it. And, and, and Propel will help you out. So let's talk about some clinical cases. So the first case that we're going to talk about is Brandon. And Brandon initially presented, uh, this is his original Panorex from May of 2012. And at the time, he's got some crowding potentially um, both the upper right and the upper left canine look impacted. The left side looks worse. These are his initial photos. So we talked about doing an expander um, and potentially having those canines exposed. And I also talked about getting the primary canines removed. And so this was the treatment plan for him. We talked about the expander with the partial braces. Um, getting a consultation for surgical exposure, getting the primary canines removed, and following that up with full braces. Unfortunately, Brandon kind of vanished and got the primary canines removed and didn't do anything else and showed back up in our office almost a year later. So this is his Panorex from April of 2013. And you can see things are not looking too bad on the right, but that the canine on the left side is looking significantly worse. And these are his updated photos from his records. And so at this point, he was ready to start treatment. So we delivered his expander in May of 2013. We placed his partial braces. I use um, Damon negative torque brackets in the anterior. My usual protocol is to put them on about eight weeks after we're finished expanding. We sent him for the surgical exposure of the upper left canine in September of 2013. A couple weeks later when he came in, I realized, you know, I better remove the bracket on that upper left lateral so that, that can just kind of move out of the way. And So at this point, this is about four months into treatment. We're seeing him, our usual protocol, we're seeing him every three to four weeks to reactivate that gold chain. And the tooth was progressing normally, but very slowly, in kind of what you would expect with a canine of this severity. And so at this point, I talked to Brandon and his mom about Propel. And so this is a case of reactive Propel. And so we decided to use Propel to accelerate the tooth movement. This is a very difficult exposure. And I feel that the Propel really, really helped to enhance our tooth movement. So our first treatment was on March 6th. Our second treatment was about two months later. Um, at that second appointment, he came in and the tag was loose. He didn't notice that it was loose. So we took it out. We replaced it. Um, and his uh, final, final was uh, December. So this is his x-ray from May. And that was taken this day of the second um, Propel application. And this is a photo when we put the, day we put the tag back in. I just wanted you to see how we attached it to um, the button and chain. And so this is his Panorex taken um, in June. And I was, I was really completely blown away by the amount of tooth movement that he was getting here. Um, so this is two applications of Propel and four months total after our first Propel application. And I have to say, I think that I have probably saved, to date on this situation, I probably saved myself at least six months based on how well that tooth was moving. Um, here are some progress photos from August. The tooth was 
really making a lot of progress at this time. His mom was super excited that the tooth was visible. Um, and so I calculated, you know, we generally see our canine visits every three to four weeks for about 15 minutes to reactivate that chain. So I think by using the Propel here, I saved myself about eight activations of 15 minutes or about 120 minutes of chair time. Um, one thing I probably should have mentioned at the beginning is in my prior life, before I went to dental school, I was a CPA. And so I'm all about chair time and office efficiency, which is why I really love the Propel. And even under best case scenario, you're figuring that your chair time is probably costing you about $6 a minute. Um, I had a professor at Michigan who said, you know, chair time is the most expensive thing in your office. And so that is really how we view everything. So I figure I saved at least $720 worth of chair time, which more than paid for um, two wands for my Propel. And this is his Panorex that we just took in December. Um, at this appointment, we removed his expander and his partial braces and scanned him for his full insignia braces. And these are his pro uh, progress photos, and you can see how great that tooth looks. Really, the Propel really bailed me out on this one. This was, was really great. So our second case is Aaron. Aaron is another impacted canine. And these are his photos from um, when we first saw him. This is his initial Panorex. So you can see he's got ectopic eruption of the lower left five, and he also has a severely, severely impacted lower left three. Um, he was a little on the older side. He was, I think, almost 16 at this, but he was about 14. His treatment plan at that point was to get the lower left C and the lower left E out and uh, see him back in about four months. I was planning on referring him to the oral surgeon, making room for the tooth. I told mom, you know, we can try to bring it in and plan for an implant replacement if we're not successful. And so we saw him in April of 2012. And at that point, I recommended that he see the oral surgeon. And I wanted to get his braces on and start creating the room for that lower left canine so that it could be surgically exposed. Unfortunately, he did not come back into the office for nine months. He reappeared in January of 2013. These are the photos for when he came back into the office. You can see not much has changed. And this is the x-ray from when he returned in January of 2013. And so, I mean, this is, this is a, a, a pretty significant impaction. I mean, this is not anything that's, that's going to be easy by any stretch of the imagination. And so treatment summary for Aaron, uh, we put, placed his full braces in February of 2013. Uh, by November, we had enough space for the canine. We referred him out to the oral surgeon. He had his tooth exposed the following January. He had a lot of broken brackets, he had a lot of missed appointments, and so I spoke to his mom about reactive Propel. And so what we wanted to do was um, get, get him kind of kickstart his tooth movement with the Propel. In March of 2014, we placed a tad between the lower left 5-6, and we propelled him uh, about uh, six weeks later, actually about two months later. And so this is the pano that was taken at his initial appointment when we did his first application of Propel. These are the photos from that same visit. Okay. And really happy, really happy with the progress that we're seeing um, with the Propel. This is a very, very ambitious exposure. Um, I figure that at this point the tooth is probably moving at twice the rate that it would have normally. Progress photos, again, from that June visit. And again, I mean, the tooth is really, really moving very, very quickly. You can see the end of July. You can see in December, again, really moving, making great progress. I can honestly say I've
do not think that I would have been able to get this kind of tooth movement without the help of Propel. Some photos. Um, still the tooth is not visible. And we talked about the fact that we're going to do some more Propel for him. For him, He's coming in in a couple of weeks. And um, this is definitely one of those cases where I think doing more than, more than two applications is warranted. So our next case is Nikki. Nikki is a crowding case. Um, this was her initial Canarex taken in 2012. Her initial photos, you can see she presented with a lot of crowding, a really skewed maxillary arch. Her upper right three was completely blocked out. Um, her treatment plan was to use Insignia Custom Braces and to order the extraction of her second premolars. In November of 2012, we placed her full braces. Um, that same day, she went to her family dentist to have her premolars removed and unfortunately had a pretty bad experience. You can see from the photos, um, she had a, a pretty bad extraction appointment. Um, on the upper left, you can see, I don't know what they did there, but they took away a ton of bone. Um, and that, that has been the bane of my existence the entire time with this case. Um, I'll show you in a later photo that that is the last space to close. It, it really, really uh, is a very, very difficult area with that defect. So unfortunately, she had such a bad experience at her extraction appointment, she was not able to even tolerate letting us have any wires in there for at least a month after her extractions. So this is a follow-up in May. And you can see, I mean, it's upper left five, still very slow to heal. And so at this point, you know, things were kind of moving slowly, and we talked to Nikki in February of 2014 about having some Propel treatment. She was very anxious, got the Propel, you know, basically a month apart. Um, could have probably been a little bit more efficient with it, but she was very anxious and wanted to get it done right away. And so these are the photos that were taken the day of her initial Propel treatment. Uh, this is at the second visit, and this is when we saw her recently, and you can see um, almost all the space is closed up. We're still having a hard time with the upper left, um, lower right, a small amount of space there, but she's, she's getting down to the end um, of her treatment. And so we're going to move on to Wanda. So I first saw Wanda in 2009. At that time, she decided that she was going to take care of treating her son, and then she came back on my doorstep about five years later. So these are her initial photos. And so her treatment plan, she had narrow arches. Her treatment plan was to place Insignia Custom Damon braces. We were using Propel proactively here. I talked to her about it at the beginning of treatment. She just wanted to get her braces on and off as fast as possible. Um, we were going to be using crossbite buttons and bite turbos to help aid in that crossbite correction. We put her braces on uh, May 19th of 2014. She had her Propel first treatment done a couple of weeks later and uh, another treatment done about a month after that. And so these are some progress photos from her um, second Propel treatment. And you can see, I mean, it's really, you know, you, you can see a little bit of um, a little bit of bleeding, but not too much. She's really thrilled with the uh, progress that she's getting. I think things are moving along really nicely. These are some progress photos from August. And these are some recent progress photos from November. Um, at this point, you know, we've just, she's now in 1925 TMA wires. She's getting some really nice arch development. She's been in treatment for about six months at that point. Um, I think we've probably saved at least two or three months here of, of treatment. So definitely well worth using the Propel in her case, and she's, and she's thrilled. So our next case is Ron. And 
Ron was part of my original uh, the beta testing group that we did for Propel back in, um, in April of 2012. Um, there were two different types of cases that were used in the beta, in the beta trial, the split premolar extraction cases like I showed in the NYU case. Um, and then Ron was what was considered a registry trial patient where we basically you know, used it on other cases that did not fall into the premolar extraction case. Ron was about 58 when we started treatment. His treatment plan was for um, insignia custom braces to relieve the crowding and propel to be used proactively. Because of his schedule, he owns his own business. We ended up putting his braces on and doing his first round of propel actually the same day, which was the day that we were being trained um, with the appliance. Um, we used another round of Propel about six weeks later. He had a little uh, delay. We removed his braces for his son's wedding. He also had a lower premolar that kind of fractured and needed a root canal. So he had a couple of treatment interruptions. Um, you can see, I mean, really difficult to unravel that lower arch. Um, lots of tori, lots of crowding, had to stay in light wires for a fairly long time. Getting some really nice alignment there. Things are kind of moving along. And that was his debond in August of 2014. So I felt that, you know, he got a really great treatment result, that the Propel really helped to keep him on track. Um, that's his final D-band uh, D band Panorax. And we're going to move on to Joanne. Joanne's a non-extraction crowding case. Her initial Panorex is not really very remarkable, except for the fact the upper left eight, uh, we had that evaluated, the oral surgeon. He recommended that we leave that in. Uh, he felt that it would cause a bony defect if we took it out. You can see her initial photos. Um, she's a, a, a proactive Propel case. I talked to her about using Propel right at the beginning. She, you know, wants to get her treatment done as quickly as possible, but of course she's a school teacher, so she only wanted to have uh, Propel when she got out of school. Um, so we talked about using Insignia Custom Damon braces to relieve her crowding and expand her arches and to treat her with Propel proactively. And so her treatment summary, her braces were placed in March. Um, like I said, you know, she wasn't going to have the Propel until she got out of school, and then she wanted to have it, you know, back to back. So we did one application in June, in June, and another one about three weeks later, which is really not what I want to do, but we were on her timetable. Like many adults, just keeping her braces on is a major challenge. Um, you can see she's got nothing but crowns, um, not very good surfaces for putting any kind of bite turbos, the lower anterior, total challenge. Um, this is the first day that we did the Propel. Not too bad. I treated the upper and lower anterior here. Again, uh, about a month later, second application. Um, and that's, that's really the minimal amount of time that we will do in between. And if people are really honest, if they're really pushing us, we will do a four-week interval. But actually, as I said before, 10 to 12 weeks is optimal. Um, here's Joanne in November. She's really thrilled. I'm really thrilled. I think the tooth movement is really clipping along nicely. You can see that lower right, too. That's always going to be a problem for us. I said to her uh, recently, hey, Joanne, why don't we propel that area again? And she, oh, well, okay, maybe when I'm out of school. So she's on her own timetable. This is one of my favorite propel cases. This is Anne Marie. Her initial Panorex, you can see she is missing the lower right seven. Her initial photos, um, she presented with a class one right, class two left malocclusion. Her upper midline was significantly to the right side. Um, she was missing the lower right seven and we treatment plan her possibly for an implant. I kind of wanted to see how things were going. Um, 
facially, I did not really consider her to be a surgical case, and we talked about extracting the upper left five to correct the midline, and said we would reevaluate for possible space closure on the lower right. And so her treatment summary, uh, we placed her braces in July of 2012. Um, she had a lot of broken brackets. She was a smoker, which I really think slowed her down. So this was another case of reactive propel. Um, so in March of 2014, we talked about using propel. Uh, I'm sorry, that was in January. We talked about using the propel and the TAD to um, bring that lower right eight forward and close the space up and not have to have an implant. So these are photos from her second appointment with the Propel. These are photos from this summer. You can see the movement is going along nicely again in July. I'm, I'm sorry, September. Um, you can see the space is closed completely. And we just need to spend a little time to do some detailed finishing at this point. And she's scheduled to get her debond um, in a couple of weeks. And so the last case that I have to show you is um, Nikki, who was an Invisalign patient. And this is her original pano. She, um, as we talked before about the fact, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are using um, the Acelodent with the Invisalign. I, I really think that Propel there's, has a much greater indication with Invisalign because basically you just use it where you need it. Um, her treatment plan was to use Invisalign to expand her arches and, resol and resolve her crowding. Um, and so her treatment summary, we placed her attachments. We gave her her first treatment of Propel in March of 2013. About six weeks later, we gave her her second treatment. Um, I treated, as I said, the upper and lower anterior three to three. Um, I mean, initially, she was so crowded, she couldn't even get her aligners in and out of her mouth. Between the attachments and the crowding, she was you know, kind of standing up by the mirror for like an hour. Um, after the first treatment, she told us that she went from 14 down to six days per aligner. After the second treatment, she was down to three to four days. Um, these are some progress photos from April. This was the day of her second uh, Propel treatment. These are from June. At this appointment, we gave her 24 to 26. She had 26 total aligners for her treatment. Um, we scheduled her to come back for um, final take the attachments off, we gave her cemented retainers, and unfortunately she wasn't really great about getting back in for some final photos, so these are the last pictures that I have for her, um, and they still have attachments on. She is a hygienist at a referring office. She's thrilled with her treatments, thrilled with, thrilled with the Propel treatment, and has referred lots of people. So we're going to talk a little bit about practice management. Um, basically, you can, you can do what you want, but how I kind of chose to roll Propel out in my practice was I hand-selected hand some people that I wanted to treat at no charge, um, basically to give me testimonials, to get me great before and afters that I could share with other patients, um, and help to get other patients to agree to treatment with the Propel. I would encourage you to take the time to develop your technique clinically, you know, give yourself a break. Definitely schedule an hour for the appointment. Um, you are not going to be spending an hour personally with your doctor time. In our office, we schedule it for an hour because that's the amount of, of physical time the patient is generally here. Um, my time in that appointment is really about 10 minutes. So we'll see these patients in the morning or early afternoon. Um, my time, again, is, is really short. It's only about 10 minutes. Um, if we're doing something really quick and easy, like a single tooth pr procedure, we'll, we'll pretty much do that any time. But again, because of, of the anesthesia, they're going to be in the chair longer. Um, 
how we work this in our practice is we um, we used it either as a promotional add-on or as an upgrade. Um, for instance, last fall we did a uh, a fall special where patients choose your upgrade, um, either a $500 off full Invisalign, uh, two free Propel treatments, or free clear braces. Um, this just helps to create buzz. And so now we're going to um, have time for some questions. I can't read the whole question. It says, how would you use... You're having a hard time. I'll, I'll read them out loud to you. Um, okay. How would you use Propel with Invisalign? How would I use Propel with I I I will use Propel either proactively or reactively. I will use it um, right at the get go, like we did with Nikki. Um, for somebody who just wants to get done as fast as possible, and the patients that Nikki sends over, she shared her experience with Propel. They all want to get done as quickly as possible. So. We are starting the right off the bat and doing two applications. Generally, that's all they need. Um, we've also used it reactively where you know, we've gotten situations where patients are not tracking and you can propel the area and you know, maybe have them stay or go back a few aligners and hope to catch them back up so that you can avoid a refinement. Great. Uh, the second question is, I've used and Propel. So the next question. Yep. Is, I've used Propel on my 12-year-old with a very dense bone to help move the midline, which was com uh, accomplished in half the time according to her orthodontist. Will there, will there be a motor-driven device for the very dense bone in the future? Um, I can't really answer that question. I don't know. I think everything at this point is still with the current hand application, the, you know, the wand, um, and I don't know, Donna asked that question, I don't know if Donna has used, I have to say there is a significant difference in ease between the older style or disposable wand and the sterilizable wand. They really improve the cutting tip on that burr, uh, and, and it's, it's like going through butter. I mean, so I don't know if the person who asked that question is using um, the disposable tips, but I think that the new ones are really nice and the, the cutting burr on them is great. Great. And I have uh, a question from David. Next question. Yes. How much do you charge now for the pal? Um, We currently charge $500, which I think is a steal. I mean, I've, I've got friends out there who are um, – charging, if they close a space up, like in that case with Anne Marie, if you're closing a space up for someone, I've got friends who feel no problem with charging $2,000. I'm in a very um, blue collar area, that's just not going to fly. And so I have no problem at all um, charging $500. It, it more than covers my uh, cost of my, of my wands. Um, where I see the benefit is it saves me chair time. And like I said, I mean, if you at a minimum, if you calculate out $6 a minute for your chair time, which is a really conservative number, anything that you can do to save chair time on your patients. Um, that's why I started using Damon. That's why I started using Insignia. That's why I started using Propel. So anything, I'm completely comfortable with $500. And um, it worked really great for us in the fall with our, with our promo where we kind of, you know, really use that to kind of kickstart the fourth quarter sales and try to get people to sign up and agree to treatment um, before the end of the year. The next question. So the next question. From Utan Paul, uh, what are possible complications of excuse me, are using Propel? What are possible complications? Yes. Um, I mean, you know, unless you had a patient who had a bleeding disorder that you weren't aware of, um, I don't really, really none that I can think of. Um, you know, if you leave the, if you, if you leave your aesthetic on too long, the patient is going to get some tissue sloughing. Um, 
like I said, you know, I had that situation with the adult female physician who, you know, unfortunately swallowed some and then had a big coughing fit and, you know, felt she like she was losing her airway. And But from a mechanical standpoint, I don't really see any downside to it. And, and really, beyond those couple of things that we talked about, I, I don't really see any downside. In some of the clinical cases, I saw only one application of Propel between every two teeth. Is that enough? Um, yeah, I will get in there and I will basically, you know, like I said, you, the treatment, it's going to go 6 to 10 millimeters in either direction. So I will tend to go in the lower anterior. I will tend to go in between each tooth. And then I will definitely go mesial and distal to my canines. And then I'll go, if I'm doing full mouth, I'll go back and do one in the bicuspid area and one in the molar area if I'm doing if I'm doing full mouth. And with the new wand, you know, I mean, you can go all day long with that thing. You can make as, as many um, perforations as you want, and it's not like it's going to get dull or anything on you. So. The next question from uh, Donna. Do you recommend a month in between propelled treatment? We initially, that initially that was the information that we were going on, but now basically they've ha they have science demonstrating you should go 10 to 12 weeks in between. And so that, that is what we switched to. So our protocol now is to spread it out longer and to go 10 to 12 weeks. We were going four to six. Great. Uh, the next question is, is resorption a concern using Propel? You mean root resorption? No, okay. I, I have not seen it really in any, I have not seen any of my cases. The next question is, if the effect lasts 10 to 12 weeks, why are only two treatments needed if the treatment time is longer than 20 to 24 weeks? You know, it, it just, it, <clears throat> it just seems like, it just kind of kickstarts the, the the tooth movement. I I don't I don't know how to explain it except to say that I mean it's basically like especially with those with those impacted canines. I mean typically you know you're pulling on those things every three to four weeks for a year. I mean especially with some really nasty ones like the one I showed like Brandon or or Aaron. Um, and you're you know you're spending a lot of time. It just really kind of kickstarts the tooth movement and everything just just kind of seems to happen a lot more quickly. So we we generally will just do the two treatments and um, you know like I like I'm gonna do an extra treatment now on um, Aaron and I offer Joanne an extra treatment um, for that lower right lateral for for something that I think is just not not moving along. But from a pricing standpoint, um, what we include is is two, and I think it's you know it's safe to say that the overwhelming majority of your patients are only going to need two. So whatever you feel comfortable with charging, if if you're going to charge it based on two applications, you, you know it's so rare that I think that you need to go beyond that. Um, it's not like you're going to lose money on it. If 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 every now and again you have to give somebody an extra treatment, it's not going to be a big deal. Great. Uh, what is the youngest age the Pell is recommended for? Um, I don't think that there's any specific uh, recommendation. Probably the youngest patient that I've used it on is 12. I, I don't think that, you know, and, and you know, like I said, Joanne was in her mid-60s, so that's, that's my, my highest end point. But I don't think that there's, I, I don't think there are any directives or anything in regards to uh, age. Wonderful. So the next question is, how do you minimize the invasiveness of it all? topical all over, blood afterwards, it seems like a procedure where people will be anxious. Um, 
I don't, I mean, we, we have some, you know, some very uh, high maintenance people in my practice and very, you know, prima donna, difficult people to deal with. Um, I'm only, I mean, really, once they commit to going through it, I only had, you know, like one patient actually get into the chair, see everything set up on the tray, like just, I mean, you know, see the wand and then just kind of say, I, I can't do this. Um, the overwhelming majority, I mean, really only the one patient kind of bailed out. Um, everybody else is, you know, I did a video of me doing Propel on myself and filming it with my phone in our in our mirror at the office. We show that to them if they have any questions or concerns. Um, and that's why I said before, I would highly recommend when, when you get ready to roll this out in your office, do it on a staff member. Um, do it on a staff member. Take, take a video with your iPhone. Um, so that person can be a resource for you that, that, you know, you can turn around and say, I mean, you know, my girls will say, yeah, Dr. McGill did it to herself, or, you know, it, it's, it's, it really kind of makes people realize it's not that bad. Um, we use language like saying, you know, we're going to use a little wand to do poke holes in your bone to soften up the bone. Um, you know, we don't talk about burrs or, or, or anything kind of graphic like that. I mean, we really kind of try to keep it light. Um, and it's, you know, it's like when you were in dental school and you were giving patient a shot. It's not, it's not like you're, you know, whipping it out in front of their face or anything like that. I mean, they, you don't have to have it sitting on the tray for them to see it. So most patients are pretty, they're pretty good with it. Um, and they know that usually it's, it's, it's an easy in and out. Um, they're comfortable with the topical. I, I personally was comfortable with the topical. Our patients are comfortable with the topical. They really, it's, it's not a painful, uncomfortable procedure at all. But I think if you get someone in your office to get treatment, I think that really helps to, that really helps to make patients feel comfortable with it. Wonderful. The next question is, would you use the pal on the lingual palatal for, every, uh, for very dense bones? Um, you know, we have, um, it's, it's a lot more difficult, but we've, we've, like for, um, certain canine applications, you can, you can feel, you can feel when you're, it's like putting in a tad, I mean, you can feel there's a different feeling when you get into the bone, and, and that's how you can kind of gauge if you're, if you're getting into the bone, you know, a couple millimeters. So it's, it feels differently. So you can kind of gauge it that way. Sure. Can you treat the posterior maxilla on the palatal side with a straight driver? Interested in molar intrusion using pads? Um, I mean, I think, I think it would be really, you know, difficult access. I have never, um, that is an area that I have not done yet, um, but you could, you know, feel free to get in there with, I, I don't see why, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to, to get decent access with that. I, I think you'd be fine. Great. Have you had cases for palpital impacted cuspids, and do they present any special problems for pal sites? For what, pal palpitally impacted? Yeah, palpitally impacted cuspids. Um, I mean, that's that's again, that's going to be a little bit more, a little bit more difficult because you know you're you're going to have more uh, proximity to the tooth. So most of mine have not been palatal, like they've usually, they've usually been facial. Um, but if it's palatal, you, I, I would, and obviously you, you want the tooth to come facially, I would, you know, do like with Brandon, I, you know, kind of 
went all over the place. I went buccal, I went lingual, I went out to, you know, went out to the facial like a trail of breadcrumbs and and just where I wanted the tooth to go, just kind of just used it all in the whole area. So that's what I would do. It's not going to hurt. It looks like that's all the questions we have. Great. So thank you everyone for attending.